It may not be a Celtics-Lakers battle for ring number 18, but for the first time in 24 years and only the second time in 76 years, a number one seed will take on a number eight seed in the NBA Finals. It's a matchup that will see either Nikola Jokic or Jimmy Butler capture their first championship ring. While Denver versus Miami features two teams with drastically different timelines, they're both led by two of the top head coaches across the association. Michael Malone and Eric Spolstra's game-to-game -game adjustment battle will be a sight to behold. Both teams are also comprised of solid eight-man rotations, but the two primary matchups that will determine the series' trajectory will be Jokic vs. Bam Adebayo and Jamal Murray vs. Jimmy Butler. This season, in two games against Adebayo and the Heat, Joker averaged a 23-point triple-double. However, specifically in the first of two against Miami, where Nicola was held to 19 points on 8 for 15 shooting and forced into committing three turnovers, Bam played elite defense on Jokic. When Nicola was guarded by Bam specifically in that game, he missed six of his first seven shots and ultimately finished three for eight from the field after knocking down a couple jumpers to seal a close win for Denver. In their second matchup though, the Joker would completely dominate very first possession saw Joker put Bam on an island in the post, back him down with brute force, sell drop step perfectly with an up fake sending Adebayo flying before ducking in for the scoop. Even when Bam stays down on that same move right here, Joker's footwork and prevalent size advantage in this matchup gets him the pivoting jump hook. So Bam tries fronting him, but a floater pass from the elbow plus Jokic's positioning a plus hands and finishing in traffic get him the bucket. Next, he skip passes it to the left wing before executing a give and go by sprinting past Bam off the ball on the perimeter. Joker shot 12 for 14 from the field in Denver and Miami's second of two matchups. However, with Adebayo guarding Jokic specifically in that game, only four of those 12 field goals were recorded. Unlike he did in the regular season, Spolstra will match Jokic's minutes by having Bam out there at all times when the two-time MVP graces the court. Adebayo held his own in these matchups as well, averaging 20.5 points, 3 steals, and 1.5 blocks over 2 outings versus Denver. The more Bam can make Jokic work, the better off the number 8 seeded Heat will be. Shifting from the front court to the perimeter though, where Hemi Butler vs. Blue Arrow will be the most decisive matchup. Jamal Murray only played in one game against the Heat this season, missing the second outing with a knee injury. That December game it saw Murray shoot just 4 for 9 from the field and tally 14 points in 34 minutes. Butler, meanwhile, would average 21 points, 9 assists, and 8 rebounds in two games versus Denver. A lot of this series will come down to who's going to outscore the other. Will it be playoff Jimmy, or will it be playoff Jamal? Defensively for Denver, I'd expect Caldwell Pope to get the brunt of the assignment on Jimmy, but Malone could also mix it up by going with Bruce Brown Jr. or Michael Porter Jr. on him. KCP had several moments where he really disrupted Butler in their second of two matchups against Miami. Having said that, Bruce Brown Jr. had moments where he let Butler get directly into the heart of the defense, seeming too small to stop Jimmy, and Michael Porter Jr. got beat off the dribble by Jimmy when he was matched up with him a couple times. The game plan for Spo will likely be to try and have Butler attack Jokic as much as possible, considering there were times where Nikola's lateral movement on the perimeter was exposed by Butler in space, and Jimmy had his way down low as well working around Jokic on the inside. Several possessions did see Jokic hold his own by protecting the rim pretty well against Butler to be fair, but watch this possession where Jimmy isolates MPJ gets right past him before hanging in the air around Nicola for the nasty reverse. Next, he penetrates, finds Struess on the kickout, relocates before getting it back on a backdoor cut, and the late help of Jokic isn't good enough. However, here, MPJ keeps his feet moving and acutely predicts Jimmy's release point before swiping it away. I think MPJ being a butler stopper will be a big time factor defensively for Denver if he can maintain the energy to also be an impactful force offensively while keeping up with Butler on the other side of the court. In the case where the production of Jimmy slash Bam and Jokic slash Murray cancel each other out, 
That's where each team's utility weapons have to step up. For Denver, they'll need KCP to lock in from distance, hit shots off the bounce to bail out the Nuggets at the back end of the shot clock, and provide sturdily poised leadership that Mike Malone and company are accustomed to getting from the NBA champion. Fourth option, Aaron Gordon in that case will have to make his presence felt to the utmost extent, whether it's rebounding or being productive in the dunker spot. And of course, they'll need number three option, Michael Porter Jr. to be following through on his deep range bombs like the top shooter that he is. I also think the slashing and every now and then three pointer from Bruce Brown Jr. is gonna be an X factor. Bruce was outstanding at attacking weak points in the Laker defense throughout the conference finals. He's got to be himself again, playing a similar role to Aaron Gordon as an off-ball cutter in the half court, and a guy who can push the pace and transition off the bounce. For Miami, it'll be all about their flurry of undrafted sensations. Whether it's Robinson, Struess, Vincent, or Martin, these pesky two-way wing talents have been some of the best stories of these playoffs for a reason. Their ability to drain timely jumpers and make smart assessments when operating in space, either in the half or open court. Kyle Lowry's on-ball pressure defensively will be interesting to see on Jamal Murray. Of course, he won't be Jamal's primary defender, but we'll get to know pretty early on in this series if North Philly's finest has the legs left in the tank to check the blue arrow. The next two factors I wanted to assess are coaching and home court advantage. Both squads men in charge have a masterfully manipulative way of influencing the officiating with reasonable yet persistent backing up of their players. Spolstra and Malone are one in the same in terms of their basketball intellect, toughness, and game planning. Where the discrepancy will lie is with their calmness and maturity level to keep their teams at ease. Which coach will crack first in terms of their level of mental fortitude with the refs and in their locker room, in addition to their competitive strategicness, is something I'll be keeping a close eye on. Mike Malone's done his best to control the narrative in his post-game press conferences. Eric Spolstra, meanwhile, has taken the light-hearted, lay-it-all-out-there, all-about-his-players approach. Malone will be making his first appearance in an NBA Finals. Spolstra will be making his seventh appearance in an NBA Finals, looking to win his third championship as a head coach since gaining the job in 2008. Denver's been heavily favored in this series, whether it's in terms of the betting odds or the mainstream analyst predictions, with many picking Denver to win in four or five games. By the looks of it, however, this could be a long series, especially when you consider the dramatic home court advantages each team should garner. The average difference in elevation between these two cities in Denver and Miami is approximately 5,275 feet. Whether it's the Mile High or South Beach, the altitude discrepancy will make it an adjustment for the respective road team as this series shifts from one side of the Western Hemisphere to the other. Who wins the NBA Finals in your opinion? Let me know your take in the comments section. This was D-Flow, and I'll see you next video.